honest, I really don't need this mic. I'm from down south, so we're a little louder um, in the south, so I know the guy over there will probably do more adjusting than anything else. But my name is Chris Williams. I'm a keynote speaker and thought leader on workplace culture. And uh, I flew all the way from here to, from Charlotte, North Carolina, because when I heard about this conference, I thought, you know what? This is what people are looking for. I think this is kind of the new wave of conversation that you're going to start to see. And so um, when I had a chance to talk to Ash and hear kind of the different things that they were doing, um, I had just wrapped up a conference. And um, when she told me it was based on technology and gaming, I said, yeah, this is going to be good because this title in my head had been sticking around for a while. And so I want to talk to you about how culture is not a game but it's certainly created like one. And I just want you to understand that with change, like I, I love talking about change. Like change to me is like the coolest conversation you can have because there's only two types of change we're all gonna face in life. The first one is kind of voluntary change. You know, the things that you choose to do in life, right? Uh, I'm gonna start that new eating plan. You know, I'm gonna remodel the bathroom or you know, whatever it is you choose to do. There's things that you're just gonna choose to do and you go out and you set out to do them. But then there's that other type of change that happens in your life that mm, sometimes you're not necessarily prepared for. Might be something that you didn't see coming. The day you wake up and you're like, the whole world has completely changed around me for some reason. And that type of change is what we call force change. And see, in the technology and gaming space today, unfortunately, we're in this space when it comes to diversity and inclusion of tech, space, uh, of learning how to deal with you know, this forced change of diversity. And many people are talking about it. You say the word diversity and people perk up. You know, it's like, oh, that's a great conversation. And I think the one thing that we're missing from this entire conversation is how do we begin to go from diversity talking about in more inclusion? We got to get to a space of inclusion. And so because I love talking about change, I had a moment in my life about a year ago that completely threw me off my rocker. So about a year ago, I'm standing in my closet. And I'm getting ready to go to an event. And this event I'm getting ready to go to, I have to kind of dress a little better than my normal everyday wear, right? So if you're like me, tell me if you're like this with me in my closet. My closet has like in sections. I've got a section full of dress shirts, right? Got a section full of dress pants, right? And I got this other section like of just regular jeans. How many of you all have like a closet like that, right? Okay. So I'm not the only person in here. That's good. <laughs> so I'm having to get ready, and, and, and if you're like me, I don't like to spend a lot of time deciding what I'm going to wear. I, I think it's just a guy thing, honestly. And so, you know, I happen to be standing there longer than I ever wanted to. And so after about 30 seconds, um, I, I, I fell into this, what I call our default outfit. How many of y'all like a default outfit? That if you're standing there too long, you're like, okay, I'm sick of looking at this. I'm just going to put this on and put this on. Well, in my, I got a favorite part of my default outfit, very favorite part, and it's my jeans. I've got a pair of really comfortable jeans. How many of y'all have a pair of really comfortable jeans, right? You don't even have to think about it when you put them on, right? You don't even have to think about your outfit. You already know I got that covered. Everything else is simple, right? So that particular morning, I'm going to this big event on the south side of town, and I need to get there like in about 45 minutes, okay? So... I decide that, you know what, okay, I'm just going to, I'm tired of standing here. It's been over 30 seconds. I'm just going to put on my comfortable jeans. I'm going to put on that nice button up with the orange top, and I think I'll be good to go. So I got ready to put on my jeans, and for some reason, I was struggling, y'all. So I said, okay, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go and put on another pair of jeans. I had another pair of jeans there, it's cool, I got a backup plan, right? Get ready to put on my jeans and those don't fit. I go through three pair of jeans that I would typically wear on any other day and it was like they all went to a shrink club last night and I couldn't wear them. And so I'm panicking at this moment, so I tell my wife, I was like, babe, listen, I'm going to run to the store, it was a department store down the road. I was like, I'm just gonna run to the department store, I'll be back, I'll pick you up, and we'll head down to this event. Well, I get to the store. Now, if you're like me, I don't go shopping a whole lot. I'm the guy that'll buy in bulk and I can last for a while, right? Anybody else like that in here? Okay, so I go to the store and guess what I find in the men's section as soon as I get there? 
skinny jeans. I just have to say, I have not graduated to this level of pants yet. <laughs> so I'm standing there, and here's the crazy thing. So I, I, I'm standing there, and there was a couple of things that I happened to notice right off back. Number one, I happened to notice that, okay, there's some new language that I got to get used to when it comes to buying jeans, okay? I happened to look at it, and it said, boot cut. I was like, I don't know what that means. Low rise. Okay. See, I grew up in a time where my pants were like a very simple language, small, medium, large, 30, 32, 34, whatever. I wasn't used to this, so I was struggling. So I saw the little lady. She was coming by. Her name was Katie, and I was like, Katie, Katie, you need to help me out. I'm really in a rush. Where are the regular fitting jeans? <laughs> Katie pointed me to this, like, corner where, like, I saw the hay rolling, and I felt like I was in a Clint Eastwood Western. And she was like, you have to go to that corner. There's probably some better fitting jeans for you. So I go over to this corner, right? And, and I'm standing in this corner, and I'm, I'm starting to feel a little embarrassed because I'm like, why am I over here? Like, I don't understand. But guess what I found when I got over there? Some real comfortable jeans. <laughs> right? So then I put them on, and I'm happy, and I'm excited. I got my jeans, and I could go on, and we can go to this event. But... I tell you that story because I think the thing that we forget about changes is that we want things to be so comfortable for so long that we forget that we're going to grow at some point. And see, in technology and gaming space, it was okay. We're making great products. We're making great games. No one has to change. It's cool. Until eventually the day showed up where we've got some forced change, and now we've got some real tough conversations that we've got to have inside of our companies, right? And so... What I want you to understand about changes is that the only way you're going to happen is going to happen those two ways. You're going to have voluntary change and forced change. Well, what I want to do today is kind of talk to you about the reason why culture is not a game. See, I go to a lot of companies. I talk to a lot of different people about their cultures and the ways to change it. And I had some conversations earlier this morning with a few of you here, uh, even some of the folks that are here represented by lead pages, and it's fascinating what I find about culture. So... I want to talk to you about a couple of different things that I noticed. Now, I'm an avid gamer, so I have loved some of the things that I've seen because you have to learn about how these games even get created to begin with. And so a couple of things that you might have noticed on the first slide there uh, earlier. Number one, it was this great game that came out about two years ago called Beyond Two Souls. It was an awesome game, awesome game. Basically, I won't spoil the whole game for you, but it's about this young lady who has this entity and it can actually impact the physical world. And, you know, there's a huge, like, story behind it. And it's a really cool piece. There's this other gaming series called Final Fantasy Series. I learned about it from my brother uh, who used to play it and I got addicted to it. And then, you know, I've been following it ever since. Then there was this other game called Heavy Rain, which is about a little small town on the east coast of the nation that was impacted by this person they called the origami killer who would actually kidnap young kids and they would have to race to save them. And so this father and this detective kind of work together and that's kind of where the plot kind of picks up. And one of the things about games that I love is that they tell a great story. See, the thing about what we have to learn and what we got to take away from this day because what we've heard so far is great, what we're going to hear after me even is going to be great. But the greater thing is, what are we going to do when we walk away from this place? How are we going to impact our communities and our businesses and the places that we work? And see, I had an opportunity to hear from Mark Parker in a recent Forbes magazine, and he said the hardest thing for a company to do is to change when it doesn't seem like change is necessary. See, to be quite honest, I mean, in the tech and gaming industry, this could have been fixed a long time ago. If somebody would have thought about it, right? If somebody would have had presence of mind enough to say, you know what, we need to do something about this. So the biggest thing about dealing with the tech and gaming industry is we've got to ask ourselves a question, well, what does it really take to make a great story? Because that's what we're really here to do. We want to be able to tell a great story inside of our companies and our personal lives about the diversity and inclusion that's happening, right? So I ask you, you know, what is it? What does it take to make a really great story? Well, there's really two elements that are really, really important. The first thing is you gotta have a relatable character, right? Something about a particular character. 
I want you to typically notice they might be from a small town. They might be in a big city. You might notice that they're in love. They have a particular emotional thing that's going on, or they have a particular worldview. Something makes that particular person relatable, which allows people to either play that game or notice a particular thing that they like or enjoy. The other part about a great story is that they typically have a conflict or they have something that is in opposition. So you might notice things like they are kind of forced into heroism for some particular reason. They have a life-changing event. Something happens in that person's life that forces them to have to step up to a particular moment. And I believe that part of doing all of that is what helps us really make a great story. Ash would be one of these people because she was just working a regular job and she found something that made her passionate about what's happening. And now Alta Conference is worldwide. And I think we should give her a hand for that, that this type of conference even exists. So think about it, right? I mean, this is the kind of stuff that makes a great story, but this is like in games and when we watch movies and stuff, right? Here's my question. For any of you who are here representing a company, whatever company you work at, whether you're up in the top levels, or whether you're just a person in the middle, everyday average American doing what you do best, what story are you looking to tell? What story do you want to be told? Because the truth is, is that not only the story that we're looking to tell inside of our companies, every single sponsor that's represented, every single one that's shown up, every person that's put in dollars or given time and energy, what story ultimately do you want to be told by the rest of the community of what you're doing? That's really going to be key walking away from here. Now, some people would say, well, it kind of takes a whole lot of people. Well, you're right, but there's a couple of things that we can do from a diversity standpoint today, right now, that'll really help out in this space. So I want to talk about what are those keys? What are the keys that we can use to kind of unlock this mystery about what is diversity and inclusion? Because it seems like it's this intangible thing that we all feel and that we all know about, just haven't been quite able to put our hands on it up until now. So let's talk about these keys. Number one, we have to realize that diversity is a mini conversation. I had an opportunity to interview a really great gentleman who works for the Today Show called, uh, his name is Mario Armstrong. And he said to me something that blew my mind in our interview. We were talking about diversity and he said, diversity is multiple choice. It's not true or false. And I said, wow, what a concept. Because that's truly what it is. It's about learning that it's not either or. That, oh, we're going to all run to this because this is the hot topic, or we're going to all run to that. No, it's about being able to look inside of your company, or better yet, look inside of your personal lives. And do you have a diverse group that you hang with? Do you have diverse conversations? Inside of your company, are the people who are at the top diverse? Are they bringing in different people to have a different conversation? See, many companies will typically turn things over to somebody else and say, well, you do it. That's, that's your job, instead of taking ownership. And so when you actually start making this more about everyone versus just a few, that will help raise the conversation about diversity. The second thing you can do is recruit in different areas. I'm sorry, but a lot of best practices in companies don't really help marginalized people. They just don't. They spend a lot of dollars advertising in a lot of areas that you're just not going to attract many people if you're really, truly trying to be diverse. The best way you could do that, how, how well are you connected to things like your local middle schools and high schools? How well are you even connected to your local community colleges? Because if we're being honest, there's a lot of marginalized people who can't even afford to go to a regular college. So we have to think about those things inside of our companies. This third bullet here, I could spend hours talking about, which is really learning how to interview for fit. HR companies are really dealing with a big problem right now is that they figured out 10, 15 years ago, all of this automation that we put into scanning resumes and seeing who's going to you know, work out for us, <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> Sorry. 
And so they're struggling and they're hemorrhaging trying to be able to only retain talent, but also how do you attract talent? So you have to learn how to hire for cultural fit. And a better way you can do that is, and I was having this conversation with Amy, is that right, your name in the back? We were having a conversation about this earlier. A better way you can do that is learn how to do scenario-based interviews. Behavioral questions are great, but if you start doing more scenario-based interviews, it'll totally change the landscape on how you do your hiring best practices. Next thing you can do is advertise on the ground with story. Let me give you a really good example of this. When I was in college, which I won't even say when, um, I remember coming out, going ready to go to class on a Thursday afternoon. And I was walking towards the middle of my campus, and there was this big, like, circus tent. And it was a Best Buy tent. They had all the new um, laptops and, and computers and different things that was in there, and I was just amazed. I'd never seen anything like that. Never seen a company do that before. And to this day, many years later, you won't get me to buy another piece of technology because they showed up where I was. And they even had people there talking about recruitment opportunities, what they were doing inside of the company. It was great. Now, just to date myself a little bit, this is like when the Sony Vio first came out and it was hot. Don't tell nobody else I told y'all that. So I want you to understand that companies have to learn how to get on the ground. Really be where people are and advertise with your story. Because remember, if you want to tell a better story, you've really got to start focusing on what is our ultimate outcome that we want inside of our company. You've heard people already talk about it today. The more diverse people you have in there, the better products that you'll have at the end. The other thing you want to do is you want to challenge the current internal processes. I, I think as leaders, sometimes we want to be able to push that off on somebody else. But if you're a leader in, in this room and if you're a leader inside of your company, your biggest job is to challenge the current status quo. Ask questions. Talk about it. Because the truth is, is if you don't, guess what? You're still going to get the same thing that you got. So obviously something is wrong. Otherwise, all the conference wouldn't exist, right, inside of our companies and our hiring practices. The last thing you want to do is you want to be able to take ownership and do not delegate this process. You don't want to delegate this movement to somebody else in the company and make them responsible for every single thing and then wonder why people don't want that job. Tim Cook did something really great in an interview recently. They asked him about the diversity problems inside of the companies and some of the hiring practices. And the first thing he said in that interview was he said, it's our fault. Truly taking ownership of the fact that, hey, that's something we did and we've got to fix it. Now, here's the other part of the inclusion side that sometimes we do miss. We forget to mention that it's not just dealing with the, comp the, the, the pipelines from middle school to high school to community colleges, we also have to do a better job inside of all of our companies on making sure that we are recognizing the people who are already qualified. We can all be honest in this room and say that, you know what, just because I didn't go the traditional route doesn't mean I'm not as qualified as the guy with the corner office. Can we all agree to that? All right? Many of us have gone to work, and you do all of the work, and the other person gets the, <laughs> you know, they do the presentation, right? Uh, we've been there. But the point is, is that we've got to learn to be able to move this conversation forward to realizing that people are already well qualified. Let's stop saying that, oh, we've got to get them there. No, they're already qualified. And they're being just as marginalized as everybody else. Because some people, let's be honest, We've worked twice as hard just to get an nth more in whether it's salary or recognition or opportunity. So I just want to leave you with this. I had an opportunity recently to deal with a, uh, a huge um, sales company that's number one in their niche market in healthcare, and they said they want to know how to stay number one. Well, the biggest thing I left them with, and I'm going to leave that with you today, if you want to stay number one or if you want to change where you work and where you go and the places that you do things in your personal life and having more inclusive conversations, the best thing you can do is start with yourself. 
See, people think that companies are just this big engine and somebody's back there with a little mouse and he's running on a treadmill. That's not how it works. The company is the human inside of it. No machine we're ever going to build, no product we're ever going to build is going to be able to outpace a human because it's built by a human. So the best you could ever do to make diversity and inclusion possible and make real change is to start with yourself. Be open to different ideas, different people, different ways of thinking. Before you launch that next idea, before you work on the next marketing scheme, before you even get started on a new idea, or before you even say, this is who I'm looking to hire, make sure you're stopping to look at, do I have some biases that I might need to talk about? Am I hiring based on this laundry list of skills? Or am I truly looking at, maybe I need to look at the person and see if they're a cultural fit for my organization. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you guys so much. My name is Chris Williams. So I've, I've seen cultural fit used as a smokescreen for discrimination. Uh, they're just not a good cultural fit. And then when you ask people to elaborate, it, sure. it, it, it's very vacuous what cultural fit can mean. Can you talk yeah. more about what cultural fit means to you and how it can be used to encourage uh, diversity? Yeah, absolutely. And I love the question, by the way, because that is true. Sometimes uh, we use it as an exclusion tactic um, because, let's be honest, sometimes we don't know. Wow. So let me tell you the best way to look at that. Um, I get hired a lot of times. People ask me to help them with their culture, and um, they say, well, we, we want to build this culture. And I tell them, well, no, it's already built. I am going to come in and help you redesign it. And one of the best ways that you can hire for cultural fit is you first have to stop and look at what your culture already is and ask yourself, is this what we want going forward? That's the first thing. So you have to do a couple of uh, cultural awareness um, things. There's a lot of um, um, uh, studies out there that you can take online with inside of your company. Um, if you think of like the Myers-Briggs test and things that you do, there's plenty of cultural assessments that companies can automatically do. You get that data back and then you can ask yourself, is this what we want to continue or do we want to be able to create a method that allows us to move forward? That's the first thing. The second thing that you can do in order to hire for cultural fit is you have to begin to then look at, all right, if we're going to make a change inside of our organization, what does the go forward person look like to us? How would we want our company to be represented inside, and what does that look like overall? Now, geography plays a lot into that. I mean, let's just be honest. If we're talking about building a company in Silicon Valley, well, okay, that's a different conversation than saying I'm going to build it down in South Florida, <laughs> right? Different demographics, different type of people. So some of that you can't control, right? But you have to have more conversations. I always tell leaders, Get about three levels down inside of your organization and ask them what it's like to work here. Because that's the true look of your company. And so those are some ways that you can kind of begin to do that. Number one with the culture assessment, but then just start asking the questions, where do we want to go from here and map that stuff out. Does that help you? Okay. So recently there have been some statistics that people who try to instigate cultural um, diversity in their company are actually like uh, punished, like they're not usually in managerial leadership roles. Absolutely. So as someone kind of in a lower tier to company, how can I instigate that conversation and help make that change without having that negatively affect my career? Yeah, um, it's a problem. I will tell you that happens, and, and I'm going to tell you, to be very honest, if I had the silver bullet, I would have created a program for it by now and, and, and done so well. Um, however, I will say this. Um, that is typically what I call a scapegoat tactic, to be honest. Um, people at the top, so our question basically is around, you know, people at the top, they'll say they want to lead a charge, and you hear a lot of change initiatives about diversity and inclusion, and then they push it off on somebody else. And then they expect them to run that portion of the company and their regular job. And then it impacts what they're able to do. So I think the biggest thing to answer your question is, is that um, what you can do from the middle, there's a great book by John Maxwell, 360 Degree Leader. And I think the best thing that you can learn to do is learn how to lead from the middle. And the best leaders uh, who lead from the middle, 
uh, Mark Parker talks about it in a recent article they did in Forbes, is he said the reason why he's great at what he does is because he asks a lot of questions. He doesn't micromanage his team. He doesn't tell them they need to go do this. He asks them a lot of questions. So if I were you, or if I was somebody in the middle and trying to help lead some change, I would start asking my leadership a lot of questions and get them to begin to provide me feedback. A lot of times when they tell you to do it, they're honestly telling you to come up with all the answers, just to be honest. And they're the leaders, you're not. You know, um, so what I would do is begin to number one, start asking questions. And then what I would also do is I typically have discovery sessions with people. And so we'd have a discovery conversation about what is it you truly want as an outcome inside of your company. Because there's two different experiences that people are having, whatever they buy from you, whatever your product or service is, and then whatever the people inside are having. And those can be two different experiences. I've heard some people talking about, oh, they work at X company and they really hate it, but the product they deliver to the world is awesome, right? So it's really learning about what do they want on the inside and what is already there. That cultural assessment in the beginning will help out a, a middle manager or somebody at senior level. Yes. So I've started having some of those career limiting conversations <clears throat> with people in my organization. And how do you get past the initial resistance to, well, it's just a pipeline problem or, you know, skills and qualifications and some of those things to really recognize that diverse candidates, marginalized candidates are qualified, are out there, are available? Yeah. Um, this is one of those things that is a long process. People want a quick fix to diversity and inclusion. We just do. I mean, we, because everything else is instant, right? We want an instant answer and it's got to work right now. There is no instant answer. Um, if I asked you right now, how do you change a tire? Most people would just say, take the tire off and put it on. It's actually not true. You have to know what tire size you need. You need to be a no to the lug nuts. You got to take the lug nuts off. Then you got to make sure that you remove that, put that over in a space. Then you got to check everything. That's what I mean by process. Like people forget there's a process to this stuff. So I think the biggest thing that you can do in kind of eliminating that hurdle is realize there's two main influencers of those types of changes. Number one, HR practices. Some of them are outdated and they, they completely exclude people from even having an opportunity. I don't know how many people I talk to who have gone to interviews, never get a phone call back, and then you, or you find out that the job is canceled. People don't really know what they want, or they got into the company and what you were hired for is not even really what was on the long, you know, toilet roll of things you need to do when you get here. Um, so I think it's more about a process. So the first influencer you have to deal with is HR. We have to find out inside of your company, you know, how can we make some tweaks so that it is a little bit more inclusive from a screening process? And then the second thing is, is that, um, to be honest, leadership has to say, this is mine and not responsible for you. And so there has to be things that the leadership is held accountable to, whether it's one or two goals. Um, and the way I like to talk about it is find like three to six month goals that can be the responsibility of the leadership that now are driven by senior management and further down as far as longer initiatives. Is there another question? That's it. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>